I now have the pleasure to call on His Excellency Mr. Peter Mohan Maithri Pieris, who is Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the Permanent Mission of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka to the United Nations. Please, Mr. Ambassador, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the people of Sri Lanka are no strangers to the destruction, havoc, and bloodshed caused by terrorism. For nearly 30 years, we suffered as a country. All communities in the island were affected and our economic development was seriously impacted. Most of you who are, you are here would be familiar with the checkered criminal background or the group of non-state actors that held hostage the future of Sri Lankans. They perfected the use of suicide bombing, invented the suicide belt, pioneered the use of women in suicide attacks, recruited thousands of child soldiers, compelled child carders to wear cyanide capsules around their necks, and assassinated two world leaders, just to list a few. Sri Lanka launched a humanitarian operation with a combination of military measures. Having regard to IHL to bring peace to the country, Sri Lanka mercifully has now been at peace for the last 12 years. Unfortunately, a segment of the international community seems to misunderstand uh, the present situation and seems to not be too happy at the fact that Sri Lanka is at peace. Today, these terrorists virtually have a free pass purchased with the proceeds of crime and the contributions from a diaspora that feeds this Trojan horse in the pursuit of a bad dream that we as the international community must unconditionally discourage. Though Sri Lanka has eradicated terrorism on its soil, it remains deeply concerned that the group of non-state actors uh, uh, continue global financial networks and it still remains active. The international network continues to collect contributions from diaspora in many parts of the world. Like many other terrorists, these contributions are usually coerced by locally, uh, locally based sympathizers. Funds are raised under a variety of cover organizations, often posing as charities and NGOs. The rump of the group are being, are being innovative. They are pulling at the heartstrings of concepts that we hold dear to further their ideologies by any means possible, importantly without the use, without the use of conventional weapons. Funds are not now not being used to buy weapons, but people, people of influence to the procurement of transmittive technologies, a complete exploitation of ICT, which offers terrorists a ready-made environment to operate unimpeded in cyberspace. Money laundering, dissemination of false information and hate speech. Make no mistake, they are infiltrating our governments, our officers and our, and our international organizations. Their modus operandi is in synchronization with the procedures and rules that we ourselves have laid out for democratic government. We must be on the high alert to identify and neutralize this neo-terrorism and present which presents a common and present a common response against it together. Finally, I wish to ask the panel their views on this new modus operandi. We are so busy trying to react, trying to be proactive to the visible conventional threat of terrorism, which no doubt is important. But are we doing anything about this new intangible invisible threat, the neo-terrorism, which is directed at striking at the core economic activity of our nations. Isn't it time that we drafted that much awaited guidelines on the permissible measures to eradicate terrorism while respecting human rights, or should we leave it to the well-established principles of IHL? Should we not have multiple standards of accountability in the eradication of terrorism? I hope we would soon find the answers to these problems. Just to say a word more, no less true is that the West draws geographical boundaries delineating safe places from what remains to be insecure. And this represents, I say, the touchstone of international terrorism. The meaning of security not only should be reconsidered after a plethora of incidents, but the role of the mass media should be placed under the lens of scrutiny. The attention given by the media to terrorist attacks exceeds any logic of professional professionalism because journalists do their best to broadcast the situation with significant uh, accuracy for that for what terrorism and media are and i say that terrorism and media are inevitably in, in, entwined since media are attracted by terrorism and terrorists employs media to make their acts public this paves the pathways for a dialectics which is very difficult to break the rise and expansion of new associated news associated to terrorism desensitize public opinion to the extent that each attack should be more innovative, creative, cruel, and violent than the other. On the other hand, 
the question with the terrorist target tourists and spectators at sporting events, new victims to install their terror-driven message is another point which merits to be discussed. In the, in the decade of the 70s, terrorists hosted and even killed important celebrities. Where tourists and tourists were our gun fired, executed and to upload the image in a YouTube thereafter. It is very difficult for security forces to ensure a climate of zero risk. Further, since an attack can happen anytime and anywhere, people are fearful, not for the present time, but for potential attacks even during their vacations. As an academic puts it, terrorism does not want to kill a lot of people. They want a lot of people watching what they have done. Originally circums circumscribed to political instability, international terrorism appeals to lay people not only for the lower cost, but because each attack is one of chance plan to kill citizens who can remind all that we are the prey. The attacks on recreation and entertainment centers have multiplied. People feel that terror can be unleashed anywhere. We must be all in it together in responding in one voice that we would have zero tolerance to any act of terror and respond thick and fast. A word, a word on the role of women in our fight against terrorism. Extremist groups rely upon women to gain strategic advantage recruiting them as facilitators and martyrs, but also benefiting from their subjugation. Yet, policymakers overlook the role that women can play in violent extremism, including as perpetrators, mitigators, and victims, and rarely en enlist their participation in efforts to combat radicalization. This omission, I say, puts nations at a disadvantage. In its effort to prevent terror globally, within its borders, women fail full extremist continued influence by advancing their ideology online by indoctrinating their families. New technology allows for far, far more sophisticated outreach, directly targeting messages to radicalize and recruit women. It also provides a platform to which female extremists thrive by expanding their recruitment reach and taking on greater operational roles in the virtual sphere. A failure of counter-terrorist efforts to understand the way in which women radicalize, support, and perpetrate violence seeds the benefit of their involvement to extremist groups. Omitting women from terrorist prevention efforts also forfeits, I say, their potential contributions as mitigators of extremism. Women are well positioned to detect early signs of radicalization because fundamentalists often target women's rights first. As security officials, women provide insights and information that can be mission critical in keeping the peace. And because of their distinctive a distinctive access and influence, women are crucial anti-terrorism messengers in schools, religious institutions, social environments, and local government, overlooking the contributions women can make to prevent extremism renders the countries less secure. Let me say a quick word about the internet. The power of the internet to facilitate terrorism increases with the number of internet users. The counter-terrorism strategy of many countries recognize this concept. Although we generally know little about individual terrorists and their backgrounds, a few existing databases provide further reason to explore uh, a, a systematic link to, uh, uh, to counter-terrorism. For a counter-terrorism, from a, from a counter-terrorism perspective, advances in counter-terrorism have played crucial roles. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, it is my plea that we stand all together in our common response to terrorism, which I say must be unconditional, must be thick and fast. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador.